Um, and uh, I have a comment for Joe. Um, it's pretty cold weather, and I know that uh, Texas people are pretty hospitable, and we want to make you really comfortable, but please, this cold weather, take it back to Pennsylvania. Is this, this here? I came here to get away from it, not to embrace it. That's for darn sure. Is this, is this are you a magnet? Yeah, as I, far? You know, and it's a double zammy, uh, whammy. My wife's sitting uh, today in Key West, Florida, and I just looked, it's 81 degrees, so uh, I'm doing something. <laughs> So again, I'd like to call this to order. Um, uh, I've done roll call uh, just internally because I think oftentimes it's a worth it's a waste of people's time. But uh, I don't see George, uh, Ronnie, or Denise here. That being correct, everyone else is here. Um, uh, Deb Motts uh, um, uh, is excused, and Joanna Morton had a death in her family and couldn't uh, be here. Um, first up, uh, we're having change of uh, members, and I wanted to give a heartfelt thanks to uh, outgoing committee members. Uh, uh, Ronnie Eichler, um, uh, he's done outstanding service, and uh, we really appreciate his help. Uh, also, Denise Williams has uh, uh, been a very good committee member, and she's rotating off, and we thank her very much. Saying that, we have uh, new committee members and people who have uh, re-upped as committee members. Uh, Homer, thank you for rejoining. Uh, we have Lawrence uh, Rassen, who I guess is not here. Uh, Henry uh, Minerus, who is isn't here. Uh, Joanna Morton uh, has re-upped. Debbie Motts has re-upped. And uh, 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 Paulina. You're, you've rejoined, so thank, thank you very, very much. Uh, that being said, uh, on with discussions. And the first is actually some very exciting news from the Texas Council of Cardiovascular Disease and Stroke. For those of you who don't know, in the last legislative session in Bill 1, Rider 97, uh, monies were approved by the state uh, for uh, stroke. Uh, part of that is money that will actually come to uh, GTAC to the RACs. Uh, specifically, right now, that stands at um, uh, not a large amount, but at least some $88,000, uh, which would be approximately $2,000 per rack per year. It has not been officially um, uh, written in stone how that would be contracted. But the idea is that that would be for um, uh, EMS uh, data, uh, data that we could then use uh, uh, internally for RACs to look at each other, how they could do better, and or to use to look in a gap analysis fashion how we might uh, uh, better allocate resources in the state or do a better legislative ask uh, in the next biennium. Uh, also part of that, uh, that we might use that is to collect uh, transport uh, bypass data uh, to spread among each other and or for the RACs to do education. Um, uh, I think Daryl Piles and uh, Setrac, you guys have done a lot of this and so one of the things I think might be interesting uh, to do, if, does anyone have any uh, uh, suggestions how the RAC might use that money? Um, the reason I say suggestions is what will happen is the state's going to end up doing a contract to send money out to the RACs and it'll be like, you know, what's the deliverable, what comes back? And the one idea I had is because different RACs have different needs that it might be sort of a, a checklist that one rack may need education or they may uh, need help with uh, staff, money for staff, or other racks might need more money to help fill out surveys or do data collection. So um, does anyone have any comments uh, or thoughts on how uh, the state might uh, 
uh, distribute that, not, not distribute, but what, what the requirements the state might have? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I'm asking for help. Uh, my name is Christine Reeves. I'm the executive director for the Heart of Texas RAC out of the Waco area. Um, and several years ago, I think it's probably been five years ago, we got like $1,000 of seed money to begin our stroke development. And there were very global bullet points that we had to meet for those funds. And I would suggest something along those same lines. Um, you know, bullet, global bullet points, but the overall would be to support stroke develop, system development so that you could use it for um, educational purposes. Um, for our RAC, we would use it for data collection to help support the registry that we've developed. Mm -hmm. um, but if you do something on a more global basis about the support of system development, um, I think that would work well. And it would also give you an opportunity to kind of do another easy check without being a survey mm -hmm. that you know says you know you must have a you know a stroke committee or or a committee that addresses stroke issues you must have the transport plan already completed and under revision annually i mean you can do some of those things that that way you know for sure that all 22 regions are at at the same baseline um, but allow the money since it's not a lot um, but we appreciate any money to support stroke because we've kind of been doing that on our own backs at this point but if you leave it more global, just about stroke development in the trauma service area, I think that that would go a long way and give the opportunity for the RACs to utilize it where they need it. Excellent. So um, sort of more global and, and system development. Yes, that would be my recommendation. Excellent, thanks. So Daryl, I'm sure. as our leader in developing data collection. Thank you, Dr. Rutledge. I'm Daryl Pyle with SETRAC. Uh, I like your idea of each RAC identifying what their needs are and the money being used wisely by that RAC for their specific needs. Uh, in our case, we've probably got some things in place that, that might not get funded if you were just going to allocate it toward creating a registry or something. I can tell you that through our data, the startling statistic for me is that last quarter we had 1,702 ischemic strokes in our region served by 29 designated stroke centers. Of that 1,702 patients, only 225 arrived within two hours of last known well. So for us, public education is very important. No, I think that's um, uh, outstanding, and I and specifically that sort of gap analysis, those kind of numbers are what we can use to then uh, multiply this in legislative ask. Because I mean, nationally, that is the deal. Uh, what five percent of people come to hospital uh, uh, within uh, the time period? that they're going to get treated. So, yeah, that's, I mean, that's exactly the data I think we need. Okay. Um, perfect. Thank you. And I think we need to realize that there's all types of territories and regions that, like you were saying earlier, that each rag has different needs. It's not that important, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, each, can y'all hear me now? Yes. Each rag has different needs. RACs that are in the rural areas have a lot different needs than downtown Houston or downtown Dallas. So everybody needs to be specific on what's going to help them bring these patients in and what's going to help them develop their stroke programs. So I think um, your idea of every RAC specifying what they need with this money will be will, would be beneficial for everyone. Yeah, to be to be flexible. Yeah, and I, and I think that's going to help the numbers also because like Daryl said public I'm really big in public education and it and people are still you know not they might recognize strokes but they don't come in like they should so and I think this is more prevalent in in the rural areas so I, I, I think each rack is going to have to develop their own their own um, need system for a stroke 
Cool. Yes. Hi, Wanda Helgeson from Border Rack in El Paso. I, I guess my comment is that I agree with all of those issues. We need the opportunity to be flexible for our particular areas, but I do think it's very important that we begin the path so that we are collecting some consistent data, even if it's very simple at the beginning, the number of strokes, the number that came in within two hours, the number that came by POV versus EMS. I can tell you in our area, we continue to have difficulty with people phoning a friend instead of phoning 911. And so not only do they not get there in time, but they came by camel, by any way they can get there. And we really, that it has to be part of our public education. So we need to do both of those things, but I do think getting some consistent data that we can go for the ask is really important. Yeah. And you said camel. El Paso's much further away than I thought. And you, you have to, you know, you have to travel a long ways, and so they have to be able to maintain their own water, so camel. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. Um, so also uh, news from the Texas Council of Cardiovascular Disease and Stroke. Um, they have sent a recommendation to us um, that part of the monies that are uh, uh, been allocated are going to go for development of a, a state uh, database. And this is going to be done with uh, American Heart Association as an outgrowth of a get with the guidelines uh, model. And this is uh, uh, hospital-based data rather than what we're sort of, we're the acute EMS, we're getting them to hospital. And the recommendation from TCCVDS is that um, right now as a requirement for being a state uh, designated stroke center is that you participate in a database collection tool. And the recommendation is that uh, as a state that we try to use this one database so that we can collect that data then to do gap analysis again and then do better legislative asks. Um, because this is not on the agenda, what I plan to do is put this on for discussion for the next meeting and then we can try to move that forward. But the idea would be that we would recommend using this database tool uh, as the um, uh, to fulfill the requirement uh, of state designation, and then we'd sort of all be on the same page. Now, hospitals right now, about 90% of our uh, stroke designated hospitals in the state already do this, and so it's we're not it's not a big push to move to that, but it would then be a consistent data uh, for the state. So I'll apply that to the next. Um, um, meeting. Are there any questions about that? I don't know if I explained it that well. So, um, out of the monies of Rider 97, it's five million, and uh, 500,000 goes for the uh, for this uh, database of the racks, and the other component of that um, uh, looks at right now to go to the Lone Star Stroke. Uh, group, which is five neurologists, and they intend to uh, work to do a, uh, a research uh, group to do focused stroke research in the state, and um, uh, that's currently in contract with the state. All right. Uh, next up is Regional Advisory Council RAC Data Collection Work Group tasked with reviewing metrics uh, for data collection, and that's a uh, Joanne Morton, and unfortunately, uh, she couldn't uh, be here. Um, we have, but I, I can address or talk to this a little bit. Um, she's working on trying to get core requirements uh, that we would um, recommend to the RACs, but many RACs are already doing this, like Daryl's RAC is doing this and has some really good, uh, uh, I think, a really good basis for doing this. but. Um, and then one of the public comments was the same, but I think we need some core common metrics so that we can collect that uh, and then use that for the gap analysis and then specifically to uh, give feedback to RACs 
so that one rack knows where they are versus another. And I think we can do that in an anonymous fashion. We don't have to uh, 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 put anyone up on the yard mast. But more importantly, if we're going to seek more resources, we have to have gap analysis and show where we need help to uh, then provide these services. So um, Joanne apologizes she couldn't be here, but they're actually working on some core uh, uh, measures. And if people have suggestions that they think that should be that should be the core metrics, please send them to me uh, or Joanne Morton, and we'll try to have that for us next time. Uh, next up is the EMS Stroke Education Program Work Group uh, with plans to review with the other GTAC committees uh, the proposals and the requirements for state uh, stroke education. Again, uh, so, so everybody's familiar, reminded where we're at, the, uh, the CEs that we're recommending are going to be uh, put into to, to place by policy. Uh, they're going to require um, a recommended four hours per certification period, which is four years. Um, because of the way it's, it's developed in the state's handling, it, it leaves the um, core curriculum open to uh, local services who have a, an education program intact and then going to, to continue perhaps what they're already doing or to add something to it, but there's not going to be a, a necessarily a... Uh, a set bunch of guidelines that somebody has to fall into. We're just trying to get this going. There have been a couple of committees that have asked that we go by and visit with them this afternoon, and I will do that. Uh, I think there's uh, some uh, confusion about uh, uh, National Registry already having this in place, and uh, uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll get that worked out, and uh, I think once everybody understands that we uh, kind of what we want and that it's not going to be uh, any additional hours, it's not going to be anything difficult, but it's going to be hugely beneficial and it'll put the whole state EMS system on, on the same page. So um, hopefully after today or tomorrow we get all the committees reviewed, we'll have uh, their support and we will move forward. Um, excellent. So we'll have that report next time, but again, um, it's not part of the National Registry. It's a specific Texas requirement, yes. right? Yes, that's correct. This is just for Texas. And um, I, like I said, there was some confusion with some of the mem members of the other committees that the National Registry already had it in place and we would be duplicating something that exists. However, not everybody in Texas is nationally registered. I think that question is still being addressed as to whether or not we all shall be required to do that at some point in time. But uh, having our putting our plan into place uh, perhaps as early as within a year or so um, would get us going now and, and we could begin this process and perhaps uh, some of the other uh, licensing agencies like National Registry might also fall in line with us because I think it's going to be beneficial and I think it's going to be positive and uh, a good thing. Excellent. Thanks. Okay. Uh, next up is our transport uh, bypass work group. Uh, that's Dr. Cravens, who's chairing that, and unfortunately he's not here today. Um, they were tasked with reviewing and updating the recommendations on hospital bypass. Uh, and as you know, that's very sort of region-specific. Um, cities that have comprehensive stroke centers and primary stroke centers, you know, how do you um, uh, get people to the right place? And what is the bypass time period? Is it... Uh, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, um, and we have, we've had recommendations uh, that it's bypassed to the highest level of stroke designated center with, I believe it was no more than a 15 minute delay, but as times change, you know, we'll need to update this and, uh, and, and or maybe not update that. So um, he can't be here today, but we'll put that on for the next agenda. Um, uh, were there any comments on that, though? No. So next up is report on the Trauma Systems Committee Registry Work Group.
Do we have a report? Yeah, no report. Um, so that's moving quickly. Uh, next up, general public comment and um, Amanda Dickerson. Uh, we'll have you go first though. <coughs> Hey, um, uh, I'm Rick Antonis. I'm the executive director of the North Central Texas Trauma Rack. I just had a question about the, the funding, uh, you know, for what amounts to a stroke registry for the state. Is there some consideration that those will be mandated to work with regional registries that may be held by RACs? Um, I know some of the AHA uh, supported efforts are proprietary. And so it's a good, so it's a good question. So the way I understand it right now, is we're talking about, well, we're, first of all, we're not talking about registries. We're talking about databases. Registries follow one patient from encounter to encounter to encounter. We're talking about databases, so we're talking about individual not following, not following the individuals from time to time. So there's two parts to this money. The first part is um, for hospital-based stroke work, and that's within the Texas Council of Cardiovascular Disease, and that's the lion's share of the funds. The part that I was able to sort of scrape out for us is a very small part. It's the 88,000. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, yeah, e e any drop of water to a drowning man, I think, is good. Mm -hmm. And it's not a lot, but I'm hoping we can use that to build up more. And so that 88,000 is what I was sort of asking about what things people thought. And um, the three things that have come up before are the education uh, uh, survey uh, uh, collection of the transport systems and then uh, and sort of an EMS uh, database. So does that explain right. it? So, so my interest is in the perspective of keeping an open relationship for integrating data exchange between the new initiative and existing initiatives in, in the regions. And I know as we work with our vendor uh, for the regional registry and as we continue to improve opportunities to collect data, um, sometimes there are some challenges you know, with other vendors. Uh, so if, if there's an opportunity to leverage you know, the, the state funds, to mm -hmm. being open to data mapping and integration, you know, I would I would ask for that consideration in those uh, discussions. What, what's what's your thought about having maybe a few core measures, and then the individual racks could have their own, you know, could build on that to have oh, more sure. or less, Absolutely. but just have sort of a core so that that you wouldn't necessarily have to use a specific vendor. You might be able to have different vendors or if you're a rack that can do, you know, 20, 30 data points, you can do that. But if you're a small rack in a frontier area, that you might only have to have three or four data points. Absolutely, I think consistency among the data points is critical. It's it's the relationship between the AHA and our own uh, infrastructure that that I'm asking about. Okay. In, in regards to the in regards to the uh, GTAC data points and stuff, um, uh, there's not an AHA component to that. I think we're independent in that regard. As that's my understanding. Right I now. thought I heard get with the guidelines as being. Th the, that's with the hospital uh, p component of it, not with our RAC component. Well, good. The, the consideration is consistent. I'm having the same discussion on the disaster side when we talk about state vendors and additional uh, potential database solutions, you know, uh, intentionally being open to data mapping as opposed to stovepipe. I mean, this is a good point. Um, um, the um, AHA is outstanding, and they're a big advocate, and they did a lot of work uh, to get this money uh, for us, and I, we're, I think we're very appreciative of that. But we also, you know, we need to go out and get the money too. We need to be doing the lobbying as well. And um, uh, you, go, you go with the people who brought you, and the AHA is who got us this money, and I think we deserve, we need to 
appreciate that, but also I think we need to move forward and, and lobby for ourselves as well. Okay, thank you. Cool. Rick, I understand what you're talking about. We, as far as the get with the guidelines, um, a lot of hospitals, if they're going to be, I think that's just a recommendation from, from the council and from, from GTAC, because we do understand that some of these smaller hospitals, the ones that might be trying to pursue designated uh, level three levels, they can't afford get with the guidelines. It's expensive. And when you only have a certain amount of strokes, it, it's not cost effective to use that. So I think the, the council, as well as, as this committee, will be looking at you know other ways where the, the smaller hospitals and maybe the support centers can still submit their data. Right. Okay. I think it was just a recommendation maybe to that that was one of the vendors. Right. I don't so, think it's so, going to be a so in our, mandate. In our case, you know, we have a regional registry where data could be submitted, but the challenges of working with right. passing that data through, you know, gets into vendor to vendor. Uh, right. and, I, and I'll we, charge you know, this for and, that and so on. We, we, I don't think this the council or this committee wants to get involved with with competition. Yeah. So I think we're just trying to figure out yeah. the best for we the all stroke patients. Do I? <laughs> Why can't we all just get along? You know why I've that. asked that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Great, thanks. And um, Amanda. Hi, I'm Amanda Derrickson. I'm from uh, UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. <clears throat> I wanted to uh, bring this up to the committee. On November 12th of uh, this month, the Brain Attack Coalition published new recommendations. I'm going to just read you the title so I don't mess it up. It was published in Stroke, Formation and Function of Acute Stroke Ready Hospitals Within a Stroke System of Care, Recommendations from the Brain Attack Coalition. So I think that this paper gives us an opportunity uh, in Texas. I know that we keep bringing it up at the committee level. Um, the TTAF group did a great job of writing our level three criteria, but even though uh, in the interim, we still don't have enough of these centers. And I think if we could uh, revisit that topic, and this gives us the opportunity to do so, uh, we perhaps can enhance access to care in the rural areas. So I just wanted to uh, bring that as a recommendation. So to use the paper as a comparison. Um, thank you. Um, I, I, I agree with this. I mean, um, the, um, the only thing that's immutable uh, are stones on our gravestones, uh, or the writings on our gravestones. Um, everything, you know, everything always changes. And um, I, I think it's, if you, it, I mean, the recommendations that Mark put um, are slightly different than what we started out with. Um, and I actually, I mean, we were the first state to have a level three uh, support stroke facility and basically um, you, one way to look at this is this is a rift off of what we have done and I think it's reasonable for us to uh, look at that and see uh, how that might work or not work for us and um, um, how do you guys think we should do that? I know there's already been some revision to the the designated uh, criteria that's mm -hmm. it's in the the state level and I don't know when those come effect is it 2015 Jane the the revisions to the uh, the criteria for designation support I mean we've already done that but yeah, we've su we've submitted that yeah. but if there's new data could we make um, I mean obviously we could compare the, this national recommendations to what we have and we can look at the differences between that and that would be interesting but then if we wanted to then make additional changes or not can we still do that because you were trying to do it every so often yes you'll still be able to to make changes I mean, we don't have the draft to bring to you yet but we can make changes to that draft that's not a problem so how about this, uh, being a lazy guy? What, what we can do is, Mark is, uh, Dr. Alberts is uh, 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 very industrious. Maybe we could have him, uh, we can task him, if he'll look at the differences between the two 
and then we can look at what the differences are in the two different sets of recommendations. And um, let's, let's do that, have other people work. Okay, I'll send that to him or we'll get that to him and we'll see what the differences are between the two uh, of the stroke. So what they're calling it nationally is stroke ready hospitals, but we're calling it a support stroke facilities. Um, we're there first. You know, I, our recommendations uh, are really, I think, where some of this comes from. So that was excellent public comment. Uh, other public comments? Nope, hearing none. Uh, uh, I'm not gonna summarize the meeting because it's too short, uh, but there are announcements. Uh, Debbie Motts couldn't be here and um, uh, she wanted to announce that the Southwest Affiliate Committee uh, is going to be offering a stroke coordinator CE CEU education session beginning in April 2013. Uh, the purpose of this is to equip stroke coordinators with education tools and resources they need to run a successful stroke program. Um, they're in the planning stages. The first conference is tentatively scheduled in Denver in April. 24th in the after afternoon and April 25th in the morning. Um, she'll have more information available for us at the next GTAC meeting, and I'll bring that uh, to everybody. Let's see. Are there other announcements? Okay, hearing none, uh, let's move on, let's see. So um, I'll lift, list those for, we'll have several new items for the next meeting and I'll put those on for, for discussion at that time so everyone can see them on the register. Uh, the next meeting date uh, is uh, February 12th, I believe. Do, we wanna, do you guys want to do the same time? Same time? Okay, same time. And that's all I have. Does any of the uh, committee members have other things or topics that they want to bring up? No. Nope. Are there any other public comments? If not, we're through. Thank you very much.